And this afternoon we have the privilege of Dr. Goldstein speaking to us on how to manage your hypertension. This will actually be Dr. Goldstein's last patient education session with us. He's going to retire this July after many years of service here at St. Michael's. So we're very happy and proud to have him sharing his time with us today. And we all wish him well in his retirement. This afternoon also, um, after the session, if you wouldn't mind filling out a form, uh, an evaluation form, and just giving your suggestions as to what titles, topics you would like to see for other sessions in the future. And uh, we are starting to videotape all of the sessions that we do so that we can uh, upload them onto our website so people can look at them at other times and also people that aren't able to join us this afternoon, they're able to also uh, receive all the information that you receive today. So we're going to try and not have anyone in the audience videotaped. It'll be just Dr. Goldstein, but if anybody happens to slip in there, we do have a consent form that you will have to sign before you leave today, just so that you're aware. Anyways, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Goldstein for this afternoon's talk, and away we go. Thank you all for coming. Now, let me know if you can't hear me, and I'll, uh, I'll use the microphone, but generally, I like to wander around a little bit. So we're starting out without the slide presentation because the uh, technology has failed, but uh, that's the nice thing about humans as compared to computers. Humans always work, whereas computers sometimes do and sometimes don't. So we're talking about hypertension. Hypertension means high blood pressure. So people who think, well, gee, it has something to do with being tense. Well, not really. Although if you're tense, sometimes that will raise your blood pressure. But uh, we're really talking about high blood pressure. And high blood pressure is really very common. Uh, and the incidence of high blood pressure progressively increases as we get older. So uh, don't be surprised if your blood pressure is very uh, acceptable for most of the time. And as you get older, it goes up. And the important thing about blood pressure is it doesn't cause any complaints. So the only way you really know if you have high blood pressure is if someone measures it. And I think a number of you have had your blood pressure measured uh, today by, uh, by Tara. And uh, you may know that you feel fine, but your blood pressure is up anyway. And I'm amazed at the number of my patients who say, oh, I know when my blood pressure is up. You really don't. And that's why blood pressure is is commonly called the silent killer because it does a lot of damage and it doesn't really cause any complaints at all. So if you're at high risk of high blood pressure, you should periodically check your blood pressure. And many people have their blood pressures uh, measured at home, which is the best way to do it. So anyone who has a drug plan, usually your drug plan will pay for you to buy a high blood pressure machine. And if and when we eventually get the computer working, I'll give you a website that's uh, the website of Hypertension Canada, and it lists all the, the blood pressure machines that it approves. The one that I think is a very good one is Omron, O-M-R-O-N. And if you're looking for a blood pressure machine, I would suggest you buy an Omron machine. It's a good one. It's guaranteed for life, so uh, if it stops working, you can bring it back and they'll, uh, they'll uh, either fix it or replace it for you. Uh, how many of you uh, do have your own blood pressure machines? Actually, that's excellent. So probably at least half, if more than half, have their own blood pressure machines. That's very good. People say, when should I measure my blood pressure? You should measure it, I think, first thing in the morning, when you get up, before you take your pills, and then at a busy time of day. 
when you get home from uh, coming from work or shopping or looking after children or whatever you're doing yeah. with your time, that's a good time to measure it. And you should measure your blood pressure in a very stand, standard way. And the way we tend to measure it is you're sitting down comfortably with your feet on the floor and your machine is on the table and you measure your pressure three times, about a minute apart. Discard the first one because the first one's always high and then average the other two. And that'll give you a pretty good idea of what your blood pressure is. The other thing to do is to measure it, say, at least twice a day. So when you first measure it, uh, it's related to not having just taken your blood pressure pills. And if you are in the habit of exercising, and if you take your blood pressure while you're exercising, you'll find that your blood pressure usually goes up while exercising, but it falls really pretty rapidly over the next 10 to 15 minutes after exercise. So if you've been exercising, wait 10 or 15 minutes before you measure your pressure. Then people who take pills say, when should I take my pills? And that's why I like people to measure their blood pressure at least twice a day, because it gives us a certain pattern. Some people's blood pressures tend to be high in the morning when they first wake up. And that's important to know. So those people should probably take their blood pressure pills at night. So they're acting nicely first thing in the morning. Where if your blood pressure is excellent first thing in the morning and tends to go up as the day goes on because you're, uh, because you're active and, and uh, life is a bit of a rat race and that can put your pressures up or some of your co-workers or your relatives may put your pressure up as well. Uh, it's good to know that. So those people should take their blood pressure first thing in the morning. The other thing that's important is you may get your blood pressure at home to be really quite acceptable. And you come to the clinic and we measure it as very high. And you say, well, which is right? Well, we don't know which is right, but the first thing to do is to bring your machine to where it's being measured and confirm that it's giving you the same information as the machine in the hospital or the machine in the clinic is, is giving you. And if the two blood pressures are indeed correct, then I'm quite happy to go with the blood pressure that you get at home. Because it may well be that you get a little bit upset as you come to the clinic, and that's understandable. But most of the time, your blood pressure is at home under standard conditions, and that's fine. But if you get a gross discrepancy between the pressure at home and the pressure where it's being measured in a doctor's office or in a clinic, I think it's reasonable to bring your machine to that site and at least show what I like to do is when the patient brings their pressure to me, I, I don't measure it with their machine. I ask them to measure it. Because there's a certain way you should use your machine, and maybe Tara showed you that on the, uh, on the cuff, but there's generally a diagram on your cuff that tells you where to place which part of the cuff. Uh, and let's see if this, if this cuff tells you. Yes, you see, this cuff has a, uh, a sign here that says artery. So that's very helpful as long as you know where the artery is. If you don't know where the artery is, then this arrow doesn't help. But this is where your artery is, right here. And if you put your fingers here, you can feel it pulsing. So where that pulse is, is where this arrow on the cuff should be. And that's very important because the cuff is sensing your blood pressure, and so this sensor has to be in the right place. So that's the first thing. The next thing to do is, is if you look around the room, we've got people of various sizes. And I won't pick anyone out, except that some of us have small arms and some of us has big arms. And so the cuffs come in various sizes. And the way you tell if you have the right cuff is the edge of the cuff has a white line on it here. And that white line, when you wrap the cuff around your arm, should fit in to this area, which is marked with arrows, as the range. So if, the, if this white line 
doesn't lie in that area as you wrap the cuff around your arm. The cuff is the wrong size, and you have to use a different size cuff. And it has nothing, don't take it personally if someone pulls out a bigger cuff for you. Some people get aggravated, so I try to guess which is the right size before I put the cuff on so I don't have to take it off and put another one off and the person says, oh, you think I'm fat, don't you? <laughs> so here's a smaller cuff and you can see that this one will fit into this range in a much smaller circle than the other one did. So make sure the cuff is the right size before you, before you measure your, your, your pressure. And what I would suggest is make sure it's the right size before you buy it. So if you go to the, the drugstore and buy the, the machine, say, I want to see the cuff and I want you to make sure it's the right size. And it's kind of upsetting that some drugstores will sell you a wrong machine because uh, there's two things. They should make sure it's right for you and then they should show you how to use it. And the other thing you should do when you're measuring your pressure is you should write down the numbers so that when you go to the clinic or go to the, uh, to the doctor's office, you can give them the record of your blood pressures so they can see A, what they are, and B, what the pattern is. Because if it's very high in the morning, you want to take your pills in sync with when your blood pressure is high so you'll know uh, uh, that your, the blood pressure pills are acting at the right time. Most of the pills are long acting and will last for 24 hours, but they do have peaks and valleys. And some pills have, are shorter acting and they have to be taken twice a day. So you should be aware of which pills are long acting and which are short acting. And most of the drugstores are quite happy to give you quite a, uh, a sermon about your drugs uh, when you go to pick them up. And uh, it's worth listening to. The other thing that's uh, uh, worth knowing about is what the blood pressures mean. In that patients will say, well, which is the more important one, the high number or the low number? And the truth is they're both important. The high number, if we say the blood pressure is 130 over 80, that high number of 130 is called the systolic pressure, and it means when your heart contracts, when the, 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 the cavity that holds the blood, which is called the left ventricle, when it contracts and pumps blood out, the height to which that pressure rises is 130. Then your blood vessels are elastic. So between beats, the, the blood vessels constrict and maintain the pressure elevated so the pressure doesn't fall down to zero between beats but falls down to that lower number which is 80 which is called the diastolic pressure. Both of them are important. So the, the systolic pressure, the height at which the pressure goes, that puts stress on the blood vessels that are going to the organs and then puts stress on the organs themselves. So that, that pressure is quite important. And then the lower pressure is important too because it's at that lower pressure that the blood flow is flowing through the organs. So what's the target? It's interesting that the targets of blood pressure have been changing. And the way they're changing recently is blood pressure targets have been falling. I've always had a philosophy that blood pressure is like golf. The lower, the better. And, and that's becoming more and more true. One used to say, well, the patient's older, so let's let them have old, higher blood pressures. Well, that's been shown to be wrong. And I don't think we should discriminate against older people, particularly as I get older. I think that it's fair enough to treat older people the same way we treat younger people. So generally, one used to say the target of the blood pressure is 140. And we should try to get the, to, if it's above 140, it should be lower. Well, we're now recognizing that 140 is fairly high. And more recent studies have shown that probably we should be aiming for blood pressures at least 130 rather than 140. And there's the most recent study, the SPRINT study, which aimed for blood pressures even lower. 
120. And the truth is that the patients with blood pressures of 120 did better than the patients with blood pressures over 120. So I think we can say that maybe blood pressure is like golf, and maybe the lower the better within reason. I think you should feel well. Some people say they don't feel well at a blood pressure of 120, but feel better at a blood pressure of 130. Fair enough. So those people should be at 130, but I think everyone should be less than 140 and probably around 130. Now you'll find that your blood pressure varies a certain amount, and that's fair enough. And that there's no doubt when you're very active, your blood pressure is high. Those of you who've done an ambulatory blood pressure session, where you wear a blood pressure for 24 or 48 hours, and it measures your blood pressure every hour or so, will recognize that your blood pressure varies quite a bit. And you'll find that when you go to sleep, your blood pressure falls. And it usually falls about 20 millimeters of mercury lower than it is during the day. And in fact, we have a nocturnal dialysis program here where patients sleep on dialysis. And the nurses used to get quite upset that all the blood pressures were, all the patients were hypotensive. And I asked them to stop taking the blood pressure when the patients are asleep or to go home and wear a cuff yourself and see what your own blood pressure does when you sleep because everybody's blood pressure or almost everybody's blood pressure falls when they sleep. And that's called dipping and that's normal. And your blood pressure should normally fall when you sleep. And if it doesn't, then that's, uh, that's a, a sign that your blood pressure isn't regulated normally as well as, uh, as uh, uh, the normal or non-high blood pressure patient with hypertensive uh, blood pressure is regulated. And that's why some people take some of their blood pressure pills at night. And that's to try to mimic that normal fall in the blood pressure uh, during, the, uh, during the normal cycle where our blood pressures fall as we sleep. So that's an important thing to, to be aware of. Let me tell you about another, uh, what Mr. Trump would call false news. And that is, what's the role of salt in high blood pressure? And I think that most of you probably have a feeling that salt is bad and everyone should be hassled every time they use a salt shaker. And that's not really true. The truth is that people with salt sensitivity should limit their salt intake. And a good percentage of people with high blood pressure, but fall, far from everyone, are sensitive to salt. So I think a general principle is, if you have high blood pressure, be sensitive to how much salt you use. And if your blood pressure is too high, cut back on your salt and watch what happens to your blood pressure. If your blood pressure isn't high and you add salt and it doesn't go up and you like the taste of salt, then I say use salt. And anyone who's eaten with me knows I happen to like salt. But my blood pressure is perfectly normal. So I get annoyed when people hassle me about how much salt I use. So don't hassle people who use salt if their blood pressure is normal. Salt is not bad for everybody. Salt is bad for some people, and it's bad for some people who have high blood pressure. So that's a, a sort of a, a dogma you should be aware of. If your pressure, how many people here have high blood pressure? Probably maybe two-thirds of people have high blood pressure, and that's more than the general population, and that's probably because there are people here who tend to have kidney disease. When you have high blood pressure, we talk about risk factors. And people who have a risk factor for high blood pressure should measure their blood pressure periodically because I said your blood pressure doesn't cause any complaints. So who has, uh, who, uh, 
has risk factors for high blood pressure. For the first, for the first uh, thing, does anyone, do you want to log in or do you want one of us to log in? Uh, who are the people who, who are at risk of high blood pressure? Well, probably the worst thing for you, and, that, and most of you fall into this category, is you don't choose your parents properly. <laughs> and, that's, and that's a problem. Your genes are one of the most important determinants of high blood pressure. So the vast majority of people with high blood pressure have genetically mediated high blood pressure. They have a family history. So if you have a family history of high blood pressure, you should periodically reassure yourself that your blood pressure is normal. The next group of people, anybody know? People with diabetes. So people with diabetes are at risk of high blood pressure. So anyone with diabetes should periodically measure their blood pressure and ensure it's normal. The next group of people, people with kidney disease. So anyone with kidney disease is at risk of high blood pressure and they should measure their blood pressure periodically and know that their blood pressure is under good control and under good control, let's say, is 130 or less. Next, people who are obese. Obesity raises the blood pressure and they are at risk. People who have obstructive sleep apnea. So you say, wow, that's a big $20 word. Uh, uh, what's obstructive sleep apnea? How do I know if I have it? Well, people with obstructive sleep apnea are generally people who snore, people particularly whose breathing is interrupted when they snore. So you, if you have someone living with you who snores and periodically stops breathing for five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and you start wondering, boy, are they going to take another breath or aren't they? Those are people who have obstructive sleep apnea. Those people tend to be tired during the day. So they may fall asleep during the day. There's some people who fall asleep at their desk during the day. Some people fall asleep while they're driving, even more dangerous. But obstructive sleep apnea, oh, you did it? Good. Great. Thank you very much. So this is the website. For those of you who have computers, uh, if you just want to write down this website, this is the website of Hypertension Canada. You'll find lots of useful information here. And the two areas I'd suggest you go to are this one, Hypertension and You, which is generally uh, made for, for the public who have hypertension. And the other one is this one that's Recommended Devices. And it'll give you the list of all the recommended uh, uh, blood pressure measuring devices that are available to you. Uh, if you have one that isn't on that list but it's working well, fair enough. But if you're going to buy one, buy one that's on that list. So we talked about the systolic and diastolic pressures. What are they? Well, consider yourself pumping air into a tire here and this is the the as you pump down this is the pressure you reach with the pump and then the elasticity of the tire is going to fall somewhat but maintain the pressure and it's going to fall to 80. So that's the systolic and diastolic pressures and that's what they mean. The height to which it goes when your heart pumps and the height to which it falls as the elasticity uh, uh, maintains the pressure. We always want to see your pressures less than 140 over 90 and as I said we're now aiming more for an ideal between 120 over 80 and 130 over 85. Some people, most of us like to be ideal. Some people are happy with just being acceptable but I think most of us would rather be more than acceptable. So why is my blood pressure elevated? As I said, you didn't choose your, patient, your parents properly. You may have kidney disease, which is a risk factor. You may have diabetes, which is a risk factor. Sleep apnea, which we talked about. 
The only way to die, you can be very suspicious of having sleep apnea if you snore and if your breathing is interrupted, particularly if you're drowsy during the day and especially if you fall asleep during the day. And if you fall asleep driving, you better do something about it. So sleep apnea is certainly a risk factor. Obesity we talked about. Smoking is something I didn't get to as we were talking about risk factors. Anyone with high blood pressure who smokes is crazy. Really, smoking does the same damage to blood vessels as diabetes does and as high blood pressure does. So smoking in general is bad, but smoking if you have diabetes or high blood pressure is insane. So you really, if you're smokers, I'm not saying it's easy to quit, but you really should quit. Alcohol also aggravates high blood pressure. So one drink a day is acceptable for women, two with men, and you can say, here's another case where we're discriminating against women. I've had enough of that. <laughs> but that's, those are the, are the, uh, the metrics that are, are generally suggested. But uh, generally, if you have high blood pressure and cut down on your alcohol intake, you'll find that your blood pressure falls. Salt, we've talked about. If you have high blood pressure and you use a lot of salt, cut back. If you have high blood pressure and you, and, uh, you, you cut back on your salt and your blood pressure is staying quite normal, that's fine. You can use a little salt and if it stays normal, fine. Not everyone is, is aggravated by salt. Stress does aggravate your blood pressure. And certainly, if your, your, your teenager is upsetting you, take your blood pressure, say, look, it's elevated. Look what you're doing to me. You better cool down and stop doing what you're doing. You can use your blood pressure as a tool if, if that helps. <laughs> Chances are your teenager is not going to care. So as I said, high blood pressure is called the silent killer. I'm sorry we're repeating some of this, but in a way, I'm glad I was able to carry on without the slides. So don't count on the way you feel to tell you if your blood pressure is high or not. Use the machine to tell you. We just can't tell what our blood pressure is. So what does high blood pressure do? Well, it puts stress on the blood vessels, which then puts stress on the organs. And there's three major organs that suffer from high blood pressure. The brain, and that's called a stroke. The heart, and that's called a heart attack. And it can give you heart failure. And the kidneys, which suffer with kidney damage as a result of high blood pressure. You also can do damage to the vessels going primarily, excuse me, to the legs. And people get cramps in their legs when they walk. They stop walking, the cramp goes away, and they carry on. That's because the blood vessels to the legs are getting narrowed because of the high blood pressure or because of smoking or because of cholesterol deposits. And you can tell those people often because you'll see them walking and they'll stop and they'll look in the window and then, even though it's not a very interesting window, and then they'll carry on and they'll be looking in another window. And those are people that's called claudication. And that's related to high blood pressure or something else damaging the blood vessels. The other area that is often bothered with high blood pressure are the eyes. Because the blood vessels to the eyes get narrowed and that can impair your vision. And so you can get visual damage related to high blood pressure. And the area that, that people perk up their ears is erectile dysfunction. People don't like to get erectile dysfunction Certainly high blood pressure can cause erectile dysfunction. The other thing, though, that causes it in truth are some of the blood pressure pills. And so we have to be honest about that. And some people notice that their medication does that, that to them, and we try to deal with it. There's some evidence that dementia is also uh, aggravated by high blood pressure. And so when one really wants to try to control the pressure for all these reasons. There's good reasons to have your blood pressure in a good area. The other thing that's important 
is to recognize that most people with high blood pressure don't know about it. So this area shows that there are 13% of people who are well controlled. That's really disappointing. I'm trying to find the arrow here so I can use the mouse, but it's, I'm not very successful. So anyway, 13%, this, this lower quadrant here, are people who are well controlled. It's really a disappointing uh, number. 22% of people know they have high blood pressure, but they're not well controlled. Why aren't they well controlled? One of the major reasons for blood pressure control is not taking the pills. So the thing to do is to try to get in the habit of taking your pills regularly. I find the best way to take pills is first thing in the morning. So get all your pills together. The vast majority can all be taken together. Take the handful of pills. Don't count your pills. Count the impact of the pills. I tell people, and someone just complained to me today about the number of pills they were taking, and I said, be happy that you have a problem that can be dealt with with pills. Many people have problems that can't be dealt with with pills, and they would love to change places with you. So we're very lucky that we live in an era now where you can take pills and deal with your problem, and that's great. So don't count the pills, just look at the impact. And if you're getting better with your pills, that's great. The benefits of, of measuring your own blood pressure at home is you can see what happens as you manipulate your pills. And you can see, gee, I'm, I'm leaving out some of my pills, my blood pressure is a lot higher. That's a learning experience. You don't want any of that list of complications, so take the pills to control your pressure. There's 21% of people who have blood pressure, they're on treatment, but they're not adequately controlled. And that's aiming for the right target. So by measuring your pressure, you know if you're controlled or not. And there's still a large number of people who are unaware that they have high blood pressure. And that's a problem. And that's why when you go into the drugstore, stick your arm in the machine, even if you think your blood pressure is normal. The Kidney Foundation used to run clinics and factories and offices where they would take everyone's blood pressure. And they always found people who were unaware of the fact that they had high blood pressure and this was a real investment in their future because they found out they've got a disease that's going to hurt them and they can benefit. So if you get a chance to get your blood pressure measured, don't walk away from it. Often you'll see in the mall there are people from various organizations taking blood pressures. Have it done. It's good for you to know either that your blood pressure is normal or if it's high. If it's high, they're not going to hurt you. They're just going to say, go to your doctor to get it checked. And if it's high several times, then you should be on treatment. So that's very important. You don't want to be part of this group that doesn't even know what their pressure is. So we talked about these risk factors, family history, diabetes, and chronic kidney disease are three big ones. So, and we've talked about this as well. You should monitor your blood pressure periodically if you have a risk factor, even if it's known to be normal. That's good. How often is periodic? If it's perfectly normal, probably at least every three months. If you're on pills and it's normal, I would suggest you check it every month to ensure that it's normal. The first of the month, the 15th of the month, you decide when. But just measure it periodically. You can measure it at the drugstore. If you have a machine, measure it at home. But be sure you have the right size cuff. If your blood pressure is well controlled monthly, and if it's not well controlled, measure it every day and see if it's, if it's really staying not well controlled. You tell someone. I get very annoyed when someone comes to me with a three-month list of their blood pressures uncontrolled all the time. That's three months that they've been at risk and not doing anything about it. There's no point in measuring your pressure if you don't share it when it's abnormal. If it's abnormal once, don't worry about it, measure it again. 
But if it's abnormal several days in a row, call your family doctor and let them know. If they don't respond, then call someone else who might respond to it. But having high blood pressure over a long period of time does damage. So don't let it happen that way. Don't keep it a secret. Share your blood pressure if it's abnormal. We talked about the size of the cuff and how you tell if it's right or wrong. We talked about how you measure your pressure. And uh, uh, I'll just let you read it, but these are all things that I said. And write the measurements down so you can share them. And if it's high, measure it at least twice during the day so one can see a pattern. So how do you bring your blood pressure under control? Given the fact that it's high, there are certain lifestyle modifications that you really should pay attention to. A healthy diet, and we're going to talk a little more about the diet in detail, and Carol, our dietitian, is here to help us deal with the diet. Ideal weight, so those of people who are obese and uh, you know who you are, strive to get your weight down. It doesn't just impact on your, on your blood pressure, it also impacts on your joints. So your hips start to hurt as they're carrying all this extra weight. Your knees start to hurt. And the older you get with heavy weight, the more likely you are to have joint problems. And that's an issue as well. Regular exercise is good. Regular exercise is not the way to lose weight. Regular exercise is good for you. It maintains your muscle mass. It keeps, we normally lose muscle mass with age. So if you exercise, you maintain it. But exercise is not the way to lose weight. The, lose, the way to lose weight is control the things that go through your lips. And the main thing is carbohydrate. Carol may have more specific information for you. But generally, watching the carbohydrate, which is the bread, the potatoes, and the rice, is a good way, if you're trying to lose weight, to cut back on your, on your weight. Moderate alcohol has an impact. And this, this table gives you some idea. So uh, weight loss, for example, if... if uh, uh, Oh, sorry, I don't tell you how much you lose. But there, there are tables that will tell you, given a 10-pound weight loss, how much, and it's probably 4 or 5 millimeters of mercury uh, change in, in blood pressure. Probably that website will give you that information. Certainly, if you're smoking, you should quit. If you have sleep apnea, treat it. And the blood pressure will improve, as well as you will feel a lot better. Those of you who wake up and aren't really uh, 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 restored and feel wide awake when you get up in the mornings, uh, you may well have sleep apnea. Dealing with stress is not necessarily easy. Personally, I find the best way to deal with stress is to exercise. So regular exercise is a good way if you find you're in a stressful job or stressful situation at home. Uh, doing some regular exercise is a good way to deal with that. Then, if all of these things still keep your blood pressure up, we have medications. And I said some medications do have side effects. In fact, many of them do. I must say I laugh when I hear that on TV when they talk about these drugs and they list like 30 things that they may cause. You wouldn't take an aspirin if someone listed all the things that an aspirin might cause. So drugs do have side effects, but they don't affect everybody. They affect some people. And so don't sort of read the side effects and say, oh, I'm not taking that drug. Look at the things it does. But we have feel good and feel bad medications. The truth is, we don't use many feel-bad medications anymore. We used to use them all the time because that's all we had. But we don't use those drugs anymore unless 
people are really having troubles with the usual drugs. So the, the groups of drugs that we have that generally do not cause people to feel bad are water pills or diuretics. They cause you to lose salt and water. And we only use those in people who tend to retain salt and water. Some people with kidney disease lose salt. And some of you, although I don't see anyone here, but there are some of my patients who I will tell them, eat more salt. Because the kidney filters a lot of salt a day and reabsorbs most of it. If you have kidney damage, some people with certain types of kidney damage waste salt and tend to uh, lose salt in their urine. And those people need to take extra salt, particularly if they're taking certain drugs that need an adequate uh, volume of, of blood in the body. So water pills are a commonly used uh, drug. Along with them, the drugs that we use most commonly are angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, that's what ACEI stands for, or angiotensin receptor blockers. They're the two groups of drugs that are generally considered first-line drugs now. And uh, uh, examples of those, the ACE inhibitors or ACEIs end in pril. Ramapril, Acupril, those kind of drugs. And the ARBs end in Artan, Losartan, uh, Olmosartan, those drugs. And they not only lower the blood pressure, but some of you might be on those pills. And you might say, my blood pressure's even low. Why aren't they reducing it? Because they also reduce the protein in the urine. And that's one of our major goals. Those of you who have diabetes and have a lot of protein, we really struggle to get that protein down. And we use those drugs to lower the protein in the urine, even though the blood pressure may be quite normal. The other group of drugs are called the calcium channel blocking agents. And those are, are amlodipine and diltiazem are the two drugs that are used as calcium channel blocking agents to help lower the blood pressure. And some of you may be on those. The main side effect that they cause that are any problem is swelling of the ankles. The angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors may cause a cough. And a lot of you have been on them and cough and we take you off them and put them on, put you on the, and I'm sorry I don't have a pointer, the uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. Uh, ah. Here's a pointer, the angiotensin receptor blockers, if you have a cough. The other thing some of them do very rarely is they might cause swelling of the lip or swelling of the tongue, and if you get those, you should stop them. The next group of uh, drugs are beta blockers. They tend to slow the heart. Sorry. They tend to slow the heart and metoprolol, they end in alls. So metoprolol, bisoprolol are those family of drugs. They're also very good for the heart. People who've had heart attacks are almost routinely put on that family of drugs. So you might be on those drugs even though your blood pressure is normal if you've had a heart attack. Other drugs that are sometimes used, sorry, are Alpha blockers, if your blood pressure is close to being controlled, I would use an alpha blocker. Or vasodilating drugs like hydralazine. A very potent drug is minoxidil, and I'd use those in, in people who are having high blood pressure that's trouble to get under control. That's a drug that often will bring the blood pressure under control. Women don't like it because it causes hair growth. The centrally acting drugs are part of the feel-bad drugs. Sorry, when I try to use the pointer, uh, that's changing the slide. These are drugs that have more unpleasant side effects, but they, they are sometimes used in people who just aren't responding to other drugs. And these are clonidine and alpha-methyldopa. Chances are none of you are on those drugs. Some of you might be. 
But those are the families of drugs we use and why we, we use them. And what if you have side effects? Side effects do occur. Sometimes they're short-lived, so try to tolerate them. If, it's, if it makes you drowsy for a day or two, and often they do, just try to tough it out because that will pass off. Sometimes just cut the dose back a bit and see if that helps the side effects and then increase it slowly. Some people with the smallest side effect, they stop the drug. And I think that's unfortunate because some of the drugs are having big benefits and to stop a big benefit for a small side effect doesn't make a lot of sense. So give the drugs a chance and if it's going to prevent a stroke and gives you a minor side effect, maybe that side effect is worth it. So keep that in mind. If there's GI upset, they upset your stomach, take them with food. Often that minimizes it. If, it's, if the pill makes you drowsy, take it at bedtime. And then the drowsiness may help you sleep. And you get a second benefit from the side effect. If you get dizziness with the, with the drug, check your blood pressure. Often it may be low. In other words, the drug is working maybe a little too well. So if you feel lightheaded, especially when you're standing up, check your blood pressure. And if it's low, let the healthcare team know. And what they might do is just reduce the dose and you'll feel a lot better. And if all those don't work, Tell the healthcare team, don't just stop the drug. Because if you stop the drug, you may suffer from that. And it's better to let the team know, and they might give you a better solution than just stopping the drug. By the way, if anything, if questions arise, just let me know. So when should you take your drugs? Well, as I said, most of them are long acting and can be taken once a day. So people who are on dialysis, hemodialysis, we like them to take that pill at the time when they're getting home from dialysis every day. So it's not having its major effect at the time when they're on dialysis and might drop their pressure. So if they're on dialysis in the morning, they should take the pressure at noon when they get home, if the blood pressure pills. If they're on dialysis at noon, they should take the, the blood pressure pills in the afternoon, every day. And it's important to get into a routine so you take your pills every day. As I said, the commonest cause of poor blood pressure control is forgetting to take the pills. And sometimes we talked about taking some of them in the morning and some at night. Some at night, if something makes you drowsy, take it at night, but also that helps to to replicate the normal dipping of the blood pressure that happens during the night. We talked about hemodialysis patients. And if you forget to take the pill in the morning and you remember at noon, well, take it at noon. Don't just not take it. Take it at noon and still derive the benefit of that particular pill. And as I said, the commonest reason for poor blood pressure control is forgetting to take the pills especially when you feel good. And the truth is, most people with high blood pressure do feel good. If you've got a headache, you'll take a pill for the headache. If you're nauseated, you'll take a pill for the nausea. But if you feel good, then you tend to forget to take the pills. And that's one of the reasons for not taking them. Dietary control is one of the major reasons for uh, uh, poor blood pressure control and one of the major lifestyle issues for bringing the blood pressure under control. And you've probably heard of the DASH diet. DASH means dietary approach to stop hypertension. And this is the DASH diet. And Carol's here to help us discover, to talk about the, uh, the DASH diet. So as Dr. Goldstein had mentioned about the diet, the, da the DASH diet called dietary approach to stop hypertension, and as you have noted that no, it tells us to eat more fruits and vegetables, uh, low fat free dairy, whole grain, and use um, less meats, fish, uh, poultry, and nuts. And 
those are things that you know, sometimes with our kidney diet, it does not agree with it, right? So even though as said, you see more fruits and vegetables, more nuts, uh, less meat, and you no, know, some of the things does not agree. So as we kind of look through with grains, it asks us to have you know, at least seven, eight servings of grain a day. However, they focus on whole grain. And often for you being on with the kidney diet is that whole grain, when you have, you have to think about the potassium, the phosphorus in your diet. So you kind of have to kind of say, okay, well, whole grain perhaps maybe not so much. Maybe we need to look at, okay, in between the whole grain versus the white flour made breads and cereal, which is low in potassium, but may not go as with the DASH diet, what's sort of the in-between? So often we talked about, well, the middle ground perhaps might be the light rye or the sourdough bread or quackery bread, where it will give you a bit of sort of the fiber with you know, the DASH diet perhaps, but not the potassium, the phosphorus that you may need to restrict. So again, it's very individualized, not necessarily everybody has to stay away from whole grain. It really depends on what's your level of potassium, your phosphorus in your diet. Vegetables, again, having lots of fruits and vegetables in your diet is great. However, we kind of have to think about with vegetables is the potassium again. So for example, broccoli, carrots, tomato, sweet potatoes, Brussels sprouts, and other greens. Yes, these are <coughs> vegetables, but within that, we kind of have to think about, well, potassium. So in the list of vegetables examples, things such as tomatoes, sweet potatoes, Brussels sprouts, may be something that you kind of have to say, well, wait a minute, do I need to watch my potassium? And if that's the case, then those may not be the vegetables <coughs> of your choice. So again, you kind of have to think about, you know, with respect to your kidney diet, what it is within the DASH diet that you kind of have to um, think twice about. Fruits, typically fruits are good for us. So again, you know, with the example that they have with bananas, apple, grapes, and berries, etc., these are all wonderful fruits However, if you need to watch your potassium, then perhaps, you know, apple, grapes, berries may be a better choice than the banana and oranges or, for example, cantaloupe, right? So in a way, it's great with the DASH diet, but we kind of have to think about what it is of it that it's good for me. Dairy products? Typically, we you now suggest low-fat milk, yogurt, ice cream, and whatnot. And you know, in terms of serving, again, you kind of have to think about, you know, with potassium, with phosphorus, what it is that fits in my diet. Meats, poultry, fish, to give us protein. Again, we are thinking about, you know, to make sure that they're low-fat. Uh, as well as you know, with respect to people who need to be careful, not necessarily the potassium, perhaps phosphorus is something in your diet that you need to watch out for. Then you may think about you know, in terms of the portion size or the type of meat, fish, poultry. So for example, you know, uh, chicken versus um, organ meats. Let's say somebody you know, with liver or kidney, perhaps that's higher in phosphorus then let's say your fish or your um, chicken or your um, ground beef, for example. You look for leaner cuts of meats. Something one of the dietitians was doing a, a study here and the, the uh, stores uh, are injecting or the vendors are injecting phosphate salts to, to prolong the shelf life of meat. And uh, that's something, and I think they label it as seasoned. Yeah, sometimes and it was seasoned, or often you might, um, some of the additives that are ends in, that are start with FOS, P-H-O-S, so that's something you kind of want to watch mm -hmm. out for. Or anything that's seasoned, you might want to take a second look. And often now things like deli meats, uh, things are processed in order to keep shelf life or as long as possible they would inject these additives 
to certain foods. Okay. Um, seeds and legumes, and again, you know, from the dash diet, it says don't eat more seeds, nuts, and whatnot, legumes. However, if potassium and phosphorus is something that you need to be careful with, then you, know, you kind of have to think about the amount that you're allowed and maybe speak with you know, dietitian that work with you, which no, would be me, or any other dietitian in the hemo unit or with, um, that would sort of help you to kind of incorporate this into your diet and keep in mind of your potassium and phosphorus. Are there certain nuts that are lower in potassium and phosphorus, or are they all? They're pre generally pretty evenly. But if you want, there is sort of, now you could say, okay, half a cup is in peanut. How much is in walnut? So they're generally about more or less the same. And same thing with the legumes. <coughs> all right. And I guess some more t tips on the DASH tips diet. Again, you know, with respect to you know, the fruits and vegetables or um, low fat, as well as you know, in terms of your dairy product, the low fat. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that you know, it's a diet for your blood pressure. However, you kind of have to individualize it depending on what it is that in your diet that you need to watch out for. Okay, all right. Great. Thanks very much. No Kat. problem. We talked about protein in the urine and the ACE inhibitors, the, the, the drugs that an, end in Pril and the drugs that uh, end in ANDS, Losartan, uh, are drugs that we want to use to lower the protein in the urine, but it also affects, uh, it tends to in, inhibit the kidney's ability to excrete potassium. So we want your potassium at least in the normal range before we give you those drugs because they're going to raise it. And so that's why our emphasis is a lot on potassium because we want, it's going to stop us from using drugs that will help you minimize the progression of your kidney disease. Lowering the protein uh, slows down the progression of your kidney disease. So we focus a lot on potassium. So that's all I really have to say, but be happy to answer any questions or address any concerns you have. Or if anyone wants to make a comment, that's fine too. Okay, I got the diagram on dialysis. Yes. But the thing about blood pressure, what I wonder, you take five pills and your blood pressure is still high. I take the pills in, when I get up in the morning, I do my blood pressure. I take my, all my medication for high blood pressure. Two hours later, or three hours later, I do my blood pressure again. It's higher. Mm -hmm. And I don't do any work. And I wait again, and I take some more, have my breakfast, and my blood pressure is still high. So <coughs> what are the pills doing? Or isn't there another problem that should look into that causing the blood pressure? Because if you are taking the pills, the pressure is still high, and you do everything that they say, and your pressure is still the same, it could be another factor that we're not dealing with. Fair enough. So for those who may have not heard, the lady is taking all her pills as she should, doing everything she should, and her pressure is still high. And so what you have to do is take that exact same question to the team who's looking after you. I don't look after you. The first thing to do is to examine you. Some patients on dialysis still have a lot of extra salt in their, in their body. And the dialysis has to remove that salt. So that might be the problem, but I don't know because I don't know you. But that w might be one thing. So I'd want to examine you. And if you have too much salt in your body, adjust your dialysis or give you an extra dialysis to remove that salt to get you down where your weight should be and then see what your blood pressure is. Some people, 
come to dialysis and in fact their blood pressure rises on dialysis. And that's a special situation which we address in, with very special drugs. So I think uh, the point Carol raised about individualizing the approach holds for blood pressure too. Some people need a very special approach to get their blood pressure down. And so the first thing the team has to recognize your frustration and you got to tell them, look, I'm on dialysis, I'm taking my pills and my pressure's not good, do something about it. Well, that's a very fair statement. That's a very fair statement. As I said, I have a pill when I'm really having trouble that lowers the blood pressure. And sometimes you have to resort to a more powerful pill. And maybe that's, I don't know who you, the nephrologists are who are looking after you, but maybe that's what they have to do. Well, I think your, your complaint is fair. Your complaint is fair. And maybe if you whisper in my ear who's looking after you, maybe I'll, I'll have a word with them. But I think, but I think you're right. I, th I think that's a fair complaint. You're trying to do your best, and you count on the team to help you, and you're not getting the help. I think your, pain, your complaint is a fair one. Yeah, I agree saying, with you. What are you here for today? <laughs> yeah, 4 o'clock in the morning, they said, they hook you up. Are you on peritoneal up. dialysis or hemodialysis? Amigo. Uh -huh. I was 13, and for three years, I was off for three, and I started back on hemo. I said, well, we should be able to get your blood pressure controlled. Right. I have a month to get it under control before I leave. <laughs> I've always said there is, I haven't met a blood pressure that I can't get under control. Right, because it's got to some, yeah. something else that's going on. Because you have five pills. Does to someone here know you? Does Carmen know you? Or does Carmen some? Know me. <laughs> Tara knows her. So. Well, I don't. <laughs> so, well, but I think your, your complaint is a fair one. Yeah. We should be able to get your blood pressure controlled. I think and so, it, because I said, well, so, I, I don't so know I'll, what's going on. I'll try to find out a little more information about you and see if I can, I can help but someone I'm get your pressure controlled. Anything. Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. Well, that's fair. I don't see any of the nurses here from hemodialysis, but we'll find out. And well, that gives me a bit of a clue. Today is Tuesday, so it's so it's so it's Tuesday evening. So I know who's looking after you. Okay. Well, thank you for coming, and I think your complaint is a valid one. I think you've got, you've got a perfect right to say, hey, get me under control. Any other questions? Or yes. Excuse me. I'm not going to try to sound conspiratorial, but this might relate to this lady's question. Uh, CTV, CBC, all the stations a few months ago had a special report on uh, drugs in Canada that are not what they're supposed to be. They're actually sugar pills. 
So people are thinking they're getting heart medications, they're getting blood pressure medications. They're not. They're counterfeit. They're coming in from the east, from the south, north, and west. And uh, a drugstore in Hamilton, actually, the uh, druggist was arrested because the patients started to die because the medications they thought they were getting, they weren't. Well, that's so good. They should, they should get arrested. I know, but I'm just wondering, the state might have a program where if this young lady is having a problem with medications, could you come in, bring your medication, just get it checked? Is, does it have the active ingredients that it's supposed to have? Because I, I personally know of someone who feels that their medication isn't right because they change drugstores. How does one go about to get that checked? Well, I, I don't. Say Michaels doesn't have the ability to check the, the content of the medication. But what some people do is uh, they find their blood pressure is well controlled and then they, they're switched to a generic preparation and their blood pressure isn't well controlled. So I, th I think it's quite reasonable to ask that the non-generic preparation be used, that's fair enough. And in fact, most of the pharmacies now, I think, uh, when there's generics available, will not substitute if they're asked not to substitute. Would that be covered by OVIC or CU? Well, it's, it's uh, often the price is the same, sometimes it isn't. So I think that uh, uh, one can, you know, that's a, that's a, a reasonable concern to say, gee, maybe the generic preparation, that there's a component of the government that regulates the pharmaceutical industry that, uh, that makes generic drugs. And they're supposed to be highly regulated. Now, uh, you know, there's lots of bad things that happen despite regulations, unfortunately. But generally, when I prescribe a drug, I hope that the patient's getting the active drug. In fact, I don't hope, I assume that the patient's getting the active drug. And generally, if the blood pressure isn't controlled, one looks for the basis. And uh, if, if a patient's controlled and then suddenly isn't, certainly that might raise the issue of the drug not being active. So you're saying it's across Canada and the States? Uh-huh. The, yeah, well, they, I think I think the point to do with that is it should be reported to the government because the government has agencies that regulate all these things, and certainly a generic company is inspected and uh, quality controlled. So if a if a counterfeit product is coming in, one should understand the route that that gets in. Well, I think the, C the CBC probably is raising that with the opposition in the government. This is election time. When should, this is a good time to, to raise that. That, that I have done, but the question was asked, will it be covered by OHIP? And I don't think that we can guarantee that OHIP will cover a non-generic preparation. Now, some companies will give their product, and because they're selling, if they're selling nothing, they may as well sell something. Better to sell a product uh, at a lower price. So I know a number of the companies will say, if you can't afford the price of this drug, let us know and we will sell it at the price of the generic. You wanted to make a comment, I think. Yeah, sometimes the price is, is going to be different. I don't think we can obligate the pharmacy to give you the original product at the price of the generic.
but they but there often are two or three generics and they could switch from one to another if you had a, a concern about one of them because often there's several companies you know like Apotech makes a lot of generic preparations they're a I think a very reliable company because it's a very big company uh, and a local drugstore may buy it from a smaller generic company and you can then you can request it to be given to to get take a different generic i think that would be acceptable at the usual price at the price that ohip covers any yes that's okay good Well, thank you for coming and thank you for saying that. Yes. Can you please flash the, the website that you have sure. put in? Sure. Absolutely. And the two places that I particularly encourage you to go to are, are Hypertension for You, which is this one, and the recommended devices, in that they list probably 20 recommended blood pressure cuffs. The one I recommend is Omron, and it's about the same price as all the others. Generally, a, a home blood pressure cuffs cost about $60, and I believe, under certain circumstances, the Kidney Foundation will provide a cuff for someone who doesn't have the ability to buy one. And if you wonder about that, you could speak to Carmen, who's sitting at the back, <laughs> and she sometimes is able to get a blood pressure cuff. I have a question. Yes. There's, it's important. The standard way is to take it seated. Now, yeah, okay, thank you. The question was, uh, how should one take one's blood pressure? Sometimes it's different sitting and standing. It's often different sitting and standing. So I generally, the standard way to measure the blood pressure is sitting with your feet on the floor and your in a comfortable position, usually your arms resting on a table. That's the standard position. Anyone who's seen me knows that I tend to get them to stand up and take their blood pressure as well. And the reason I do that is to make sure the pressure isn't falling. Because some people have a disorder of blood pressure regulation that it really falls when they stand up, particularly diabetics. And so I like to make sure that someone's blood pressure isn't falling when they stand up. You will tend to know because you'll get dizzy. So if someone gets dizzy standing up, certain drugs are prone to cause that. It's called postural hypotension. So people who are prone to that probably should not be taking certain drugs that are predisposed to cause postural hypotension. It also happens if you tend to get salt depleted. So if you've been vomiting or had diarrhea, your blood pressure may fall when you stand up, and those people should take some extra salt to stop that. But generally, you take your blood pressure sitting with your feet on the floor, take it three times about a minute apart. Discard the first one and average the second and third. And the reason they do that is just to make sure that you're not one of those people whose blood pressure tends to fall. If it falls a little bit, it's okay. 
but some people might go from 130 over 80 to 80 over 60 when they stand up. That's very important. So that's why they ask it. Good question. OK. <coughs> yes? You mentioned something about uh, taking your blood pressure medicine in the morning. Is it, uh, is it a regular one that you should have it in the morning? But then no. you mentioned that it should be, there are times that you have to drink it in the evening. I mean, I didn't quite get that. Yeah. So I, what I said, or what I meant to say, is you should be in a routine of regularly taking your pills at the same time every day. I find that most people can remember to take their pills first thing in the morning. Because it's just a habit. You get up, you brush your teeth, you do a few things, you take your pills. Then the day gets busy. And if you don't take them first thing in the day, chances are you're probably are going to forget later in the day. Some people are very focused and can take their pill at any time. People on hemodialysis, we tend to tell them to take the pill at the time they're going to come home from dialysis every day. So if they're on a, 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 a dialysis regimen where they take their pill, in, where they are on dialysis in the morning, and they get home at noon, I suggest that they take their pills every day at noon. Because if they took them in the morning, the pill would be having its peak effect at the time when they're on dialysis and may drop their pressure even more. So that's why I suggested that some people should take it at a different time. The other thing is that normally, the blood pressure falls when you go to sleep. So some people who are taking a lot of blood pressure pills like to take some of them when they go to bed, so that mimics that normal pattern of the blood pressure falling while they're asleep. So the important thing is to take it regularly. The time of the day is less important, but certain times of the day make more sense for any given person. If a pill makes you drowsy, take it when, before you go to sleep. It'll help you sleep too. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. One very final question. When is a good time to take your blood pressure? Before the shower or after? I wouldn't take it after, because after a hot shower, often your blood pressure is low. So if I was going to take my blood pressure related to a shower, I'd take it first. Okay. Good, you're welcome. Good, thank you very much for your attention.